Hi, um, I'll start. My name is Leslie Mater, and I work with Innovage as their strategic account executive. And in my role, I try to build partnerships with housing authorities, um, resident service coordinators like yourselves, to help them understand our program and how it can benefit their residents. And very pleased today to have Dr. Evans presenting for us on bladder health. And I think you're gonna enjoy our time. And I think because our group at this point isn't that large, um, it'd be great to see faces. Um, also to have any kind of questions in the chat box, but I know that the more interaction, um, the better. So we could even have you um, unmuted at some point too. That would be great. So um, Dr. Evans, do you wanna say anything about yourself before we start? <laughs> Well, I think 40 years in practice probably sums it up and my gray hair goes with that. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to our, our chat and hopefully there will be some questions generated that makes it a lot more fun. For sure. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Let's just get the slideshow going here. Okay, and I'm going to do that. Oh, maybe that, so whoever's speaking. Um, so bladder health and older adults, that will, that's what we'll be speaking about. But before we get started, I wanted to just go over briefly what we'll be covering today. Uh, those of you that are on the call, I believe have many of you have already been on our calls and, and have heard about our model of care. I just want to go over, um, I just want to go over it again to um, kind of highlight some ways to be thinking about us. And then we're gonna have um, Dr. Evans go through these different um, changes and abnormal signs and red flags and some clinical examples for you. Um, so you can understand how we um, treat folks and then be able to maybe possibly identify somebody else that might be struggling that you're working with. So we've had this slide before. This is a typical pace center. We're all over the country. Um, we have beautiful buildings where we bring participants there and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second. I think, you know, I've, been, I've, I've shared this information a few times already and I think one way to think about us is that we are a healthcare insurance provider for older adults. So we are an option for folks who um, are on Medicare and who are also Medicaid eligible. So think about that too when you're working with people. Um, we're not just kind of this different program, but we're actually a insurance provider and we're a pro and we are the medical provider as well. And as I've mentioned before, this is a national model of care. We, there are over 272 pace centers in the country in 31 states. And this data, I needed to update it, this is closer to 60,000 older adults nationwide that are being treated. It's a holistic model of care, helping older adults who are coping with aging issues. I mentioned about we're both the insurance and the medical provider, and it's all inclusive. We work with Medicaid as a long-term care option. So for those that of your folks that have Medicaid, we can help them and we can help them get on Medicaid. So the, really the goal of the, Medic, the uh, PACE model is to help seniors live independently for as long as possible. And for InnovAge, our mission statement is to sustain and enhance the independence and quality of life on their terms for those that we serve. So we really want people to age the way they want to age in place. So that's really critical. No one really wants to grow up and go to a skilled nursing facility. They really want to stay in their apartments, in their homes, and be independent for as long as possible. And we try to help them with that goal. Just a quick reminder, just four bullet points in any PACE program, the eligibility is you have to be 55 and older. You need to live in the certified zip codes of the PACE program. You have to be able to remain safe in the community at the time of enrollment. So that means you can't be homeless and you need to have an actual address where we can serve you. And then you have to meet the state's skilled nursing level of care requirements. And that's different in every state. So um, there'll be a functional assessment that takes place to assess how many ADLs somebody might have um, that, needs to, that they need to have assistance with. The circle of care, um, we've gone over this before, but I think it really helps visually to see that we are a social model of care um, medical model, we provide all the primary care. And if you go underneath that roof of a pace center, that's where the medical clinic is, where they receive all their primary care, that you have maybe a nursing appointment, blood draws, things like that. Then there's also a rehab center where they can get endless physical therapy, a dental clinic where they can have dental care. 
and then activity rooms where they can receive a hot meal, breakfast, lunch, um, interact with other folks. And also there's a low stimulation room in each center for folks with memory issues. So that's a place that's fully staffed um, and they're interacted with and fed, but gives caregivers a break during the day too. So our day, day center is really a wonderful place for people to get engaged and to um, help caregivers have some respite. Transportation is really big for seniors. We provide that to and from our, our center and to specialists. Uh, we provide hearing aids and vision and foot care as well, as well as the dental. We do in-home services that are task-based and we prescribe their medications and deliver that to them. So I just wanted to quickly go through that circle of care, uh, but it, it's a good visual just to remember um, how all-inclusive this program is. Picture from our, our interdisciplinary team. You'll hear more about how they work together with folks when um, Dr. Evans speaks, but they meet every morning and go through um, our participants. Someone maybe had been hospitalized or fell during the night or needs to be seen urgently. Everybody hears about it in morning meeting. And there are 11 different disciplines um, that create care plans and interact with our participants. Care plans are updated every six months. So, um, I think that's really a great thing. We have to see everybody at least every six months. This is a list of our interdisciplinary team. As you can see, there's a primary care physician, registered nurse, director of social work. We have PT, OT, rec therapy, pay center director, dietitian. There's a day room supervisor, home health care coordinator, and transportation. And really, each one of these people has an equal voice on the team, and they can speak up about their concerns or their recommendations. And one thing I really love about this model of care is that the participant can really speak into their goals and what they would like to achieve with our program, which I think is really unique, where um, it's really about what their goals are and they, can, and they can disagree with us if they don't like the plans that we've created. So um, it's, I think it's just it's very participant-centered, very person-centered. So, and I like to just remind you how we can help stabilize your residents. We, because of our model of care and the interaction that we have with folks, we can prevent hospitalizations and we can try to keep people out of skilled nursing. The center visits are really opportunities for early intervention. We have eyes on them. We can see that they may be going into decline and we can intervene sooner than later. We prevent social isolation because we are a social model and they're coming to the day center and interacting or even just observing people interacting. Maybe they're not that outgoing, but they can be there with everyone else. Um, as I mentioned, all the transportation to medical appointments, and we also coordinate all their medical appointments through specialty appointments. We schedule everything for them and, and make all the arrangements. And I think what's really wonderful about the PACE model is it's one-stop shopping. It's service all under one roof. So that really helps folks as they age. They don't have to worry about all that coordination. Lots of case management, and we do coordinate all their health care. And then when someone needs to be to go to a higher level of care like assisted living or skilled nursing, we have contracts and we can help them get into those facilities. Uh, lastly, I think this may be the last slide for me is that enrollment is at the first of the month and disenrollment can be at the end of any month if they're not satisfied with us. So it's different than other Medicare, kind of that open enrollment timeframe for older adults um, in late fall. Uh, so they can enroll at the first of any month. We help them with all their paperwork help them with their Medicaid application, um, anything that we need to do to get them on to our um, long-term care option. And it's Medicaid and Medicare. It can be Medicaid only, and then there's the self-pay option as well. So that is it. And now we're on to bladder health with Dr. Evans. Well, thank you. There's my first slide. And uh, as you can imagine, bladder health is such a wonderfully popular topic. Um, just to let you know, I, I recently was asked my, my granddaughter to come to her middle school and give a talk, and I elected to talk about bladder health, and you can imagine the reception was rather uh, bland. So <clears throat> it's a popular topic, but not for middle schoolers. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen in the last 15, 20 years is uh, pharmaceutical industry becoming much more active in terms of um, advertising to the public and actually creating a need for products, sometimes that are, that are necessary, uh, sometimes not. So you get to see ads now for medication for 
I gotta go, I gotta go medicine. You see medicine for um, depends and other uh, incontinence supplies. So this is becoming something that's visible to the public, which is I think in some ways very good. I mean, occasionally because uh, the push for medication sometimes not always so good. Uh, but if I was to give this talk and I have given this talk at a senior group, like a senior walking group, um, I tend to get a different response. So Leslie, next slide. So this, this is my response when I talk about bladder health to a senior group. Um, you know, all of them are very excited. This is a wonderful thing to talk about. And this is a walking group. So this is a group at a senior center who walks. And so for them, bladder health uh, really is uh, very important. Now, to kind of focus things a little bit, I am uh, I did did volunteer two of my patients to participate in uh, this discussion. So I'm going to talk about two of the people I take care of. Now their names have been changed slightly, and their photograph might be a little bit different than the real person. Uh, but these are folks that I actually uh, do take care of. So if we can have the next slide, Leslie. So this this handsome couple is Pablo and Terry uh, and their dog Sullivan. Uh, Pablo and Terry are in the walking club. They did end up uh, joining Pace for a variety of medical issues. Uh, we didn't take Pablo. We don't have, I mean, we, I'm sorry, we took Pablo. We don't, we don't take Sullivan. So if we need to, we do provide some care for Sullivan as well. So, so Pablo um, has some early dementia uh, which is kind of what led to him being enrolled in PACE. Um, he does have some prostate issues, uh, which cause some bladder uh, problems. He has to go frequently. He does have high blood pressure, and he is on a fluid pill for his high blood pressure. Um, Terry has diabetes um, and was started on four different medications for diabetes, all of which she's not sure she wants to take, so she's relatively noncompliant in her um, medication management. Um, and she's worried because she has had some low blood sugars. So some anxiety there with that. Uh, she also has some mild heart failure. So Terry's on a fairly high dose of a diuretic uh, fluid pill for her, her mild heart failure. And unfortunately, um, as part of her aging issues, uh, Terry's had six kids and she's got a little bit of a prolapse. So she's got a little bit of a dangling bladder and that unfortunately has caused her to have some issues with urinary frequency as well. So they they both joined PACE and um, we're going to talk to them about what's important for them. So they're at the center of what we do at PACE. So we're going to find out for Pablo and Terry what's important in their life, what makes their life worth living and uh, and we'll, we'll go from that issue and then sort of expand it to talk about how their bladder issues affect this. So next slide, Leslie. So this is my personal PACE model, sorry. Um, so when I, when I uh, so you know, don't take this out and sell it around the place. But when I, when I do teach geriatrics and one of the things that I teach in geriatrics is um, management of geriatric problems like bladder issues. But I think for me, uh, and part of my teaching is the key for me is that the secret of patient care is really caring for the patient. And that's been a statement that's been around since the 1930s. But it's, it really is so true. So building that relationship, you see down the bottom, the, the foundation of medical care for the PACE model is we have a relationship and not just with the physicians and, and the nurse practitioners, but the, the drivers. I mean, a lot of our, of my PACE participants would be happy to get rid of me as their physician, but they would not get rid of their driver. So they, they build relationships with their nurses, with the therapists, with the drivers, with the, the, the aides that come to their home, very important. Um, you see on the left side, uh, patient story. And I just kind of gave you some background about Pablo and Terry. So their story is very important, but what they're, what 
for them, what's most important is that they, they go for walks. They take Sullivan for a walk, they go outside, they tootle around, they, they, they climb those hills you see behind Leslie. They, that's, a, that's what's important to them. On the other side, uh, the right side, you see what I call the medical story, which is what I gave you. So Pablo's dementia and Terry's prolapsing bladder, those are all part of their medical story, which are important, but just focusing on that doesn't really address what's important to Terry and Pablo. So we're gonna come up with a, uh, a plan of caring for them that really is focused on what, what their goals are. Um, and so that, you heard Leslie mention the, the patient-centered care, participant-centered care. That's really what it is, that, that, that the participants get a chance to um, give us what's important. Um, next slide, please, Leslie. So in sort of taking the medical stories, that right-hand part, uh, both Pablo and Terry are on fluid pills. Um, Terry's on fluid pills primarily for um, the heart failure and Pablo for high blood pressure. Um, Pablo was started on some dementia medicine, uh, you know, Aricept, which is a very common medication. You probably have many of your folks you care for on Aricept. Uh, Aricept can be helpful in dementia, uh, but it has, unfortunately, very significant impact on the bladder. So it makes, it causes people to have to urinate more. So it's a bladder stimulant. So if you wanted somebody to have to go to the bathroom 10 times and say instead of five times a day, starting them on Aricept might be a good way to try and get them in the bathroom more. Uh, and and interesting enough, so that gotta go, gotta go medicine that's advertised, uh, <clears throat> that medication does slow the bladder down. It also slows the brain down. So Pablo was started on a low dose of Aricept, started peeing more, and his doctor gave him that bladder, magic bladder pill, uh, which did slow his urination down, but made his dementia worse leading to an increase in his dementia medication. Uh, the diabetes treatment for, um, that we see there, that, you know, I think that a complicated regimen of diabetic care is, is difficult. Um, fears about low blood sugar are real. So Terry's concern about this treatment uh, was certainly appropriate. Um, and so, you know, they, they want to they, they know, how can we do this better? Um, they've both been treated multiple times, actually, for urinary tract infections. So I just want to say that uh, commonly when uh, Pablo got a little bit more demented, a little more agitated, people would say, ah, it must be a bladder infection. Uh, when uh, Terry complained that I'm really urinating all the time, probably because her blood sugar was 300, <clears throat> the easy answer was, whoa, it must be a urinary tract infection. So both of them have been treated multiple times for urinary tract infections. So one of the things they asked me when we talked about that is, okay, well, Dr. Evans, tell me about this. What? Tell me about what's normal for my bladder and my urinary function. So next slide, please, Leslie. So we had a, we had a discussion about what's normal in aging. So part of the issue with aging is the bladders do get a little more irritable. Uh, so more frequent urination is very common. The kidneys can't concentrate the urine quite as, as well. So we actually uh, may produce more urine in situations um, than we would otherwise do so. So more urine, less capacity in the bladder. So more frequently having to go to the bathroom. Um, the other thing is that with 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 uh, Pablo's prostate, you know his his urine doesn't flow normally, so a little bit more irritability, a little more dripping, all that stuff is normal. And if you look at Terry, she's got this bladder that's prolapsed down, so it doesn't empty normally. So she has to really have more more strain at getting her bladder to empty. The other thing, which is very common as people age more so in women even than men, but very common is the urine in the bladder no longer remains sterile. So when you're 
the middle school kids that I talked to, I'm sure every single one of them had completely sterile urine. Nothing would grow. You look at that urine as clean as a whistle. When you look at Terry's urine, even when she's not sick at all and doing fine, she's going to have some white blood cells, some pus cells in the urine. She's probably going to have some bacteria. If you did a urine culture, um, it would probably grow the bacteria that are living in her bladder. And especially with the fact that she's not controlling her sugar well, you know, that's a nice place, nice sweet urine, good place to grow some bacteria. So those are all normal things. And that's why I explained to both Pablo and Terry that there's not really a lab test that will tell you you have a bladder infection, right? If I do, if I do a urine test on Terry today, her urine may well grow bacteria. So, and it may have pus cells in it and she doesn't have a bladder infection. So they both asked me, all right, smart Dr. Evans, tell me what I have to look for. When, when do I know that I do have a bladder infection? So uh, next slide, Leslie, please. So what I told them was one of the things to look for, the signs that are not normal is when you come and tell me that it burns like the dickens every time I urinate, I'm, I'm just, it just hurts like crazy when I go. That, that's not normal. And that would require something to, um, something to look at. The other thing is, uh, frequency. If some if somebody is going four or five times a day, and all of a sudden now they're going ten times a day and having trouble controlling it, so a sudden change like that, that would be something that would make me want to check and see if they might have a bladder or urine tract infection. Uh, next slide, Leslie. The other thing on physical examination. Again, remember I said before that you can't diagnose a urinary tract infection or a bladder infection with just a lab test. Just checking the urine by itself is not gonna give you the information you need. Uh, so on physical examination, if somebody's got tenderness over their kidneys on exam or fairly significant bladder tenderness, that would be more suggestive of a bladder infection. Or you can see the fever, so abnormal vital signs. So somebody's having the burning urine frequency and running a fever, that would make you want to really look to see if this person might have um, a urinary tract infection. So you really need to look at other signs to tell you about that. Um, next slide. So Pablo and Terry were listened to all this and said, "But Dr. Evans, you know what are we going to do? We we love to go walking. We take Sullivan out on our walks." Uh, with both of them, Pablo and Terry, having this urinary frequency, it makes it difficult for them to walk. Uh, in, uh, Sullivan also has urinary frequency, but, uh, but fortunately for Sullivan, he can go any place he wants. Uh, a little more difficult for Pablo and Terry. So they, they sort of said, well, what, what can we do? Um, okay, next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what are the things that can be learned that can help both Pablo and Terry, but anybody help their bladder work better. And one of the things that's very important really is drinking enough fluid. That seems to be counterintuitive. That seems to be something that many of my patients would say, well, Dr. Evans, if I have to urinate a lot, then wouldn't it make the most sense for me to not drink so much fluid? And what I usually tell them is what happens when you don't drink enough fluid is your urine gets quite concentrated and it gets more acidic. And so it has a nice bright yellow color. It smells funny and it, and it irritates your bladder. So you end up going more because the urine is more concentrated and more irritable. So actually drinking more fluids can often reduce how often you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, caffeine, most of us like having a couple cups of coffee in the morning. Uh, caffeine is a bladder stimulant and a diuretic. Uh, so for both Pablo and Terry having that morning coffee, they may want to have decaffeinated and then have a caffeinated coffee when they come home. But I think caffeine intake is one of the things that certainly I would look at the same way I would look at that if Pablo and Terry told me if they're having trouble sleeping, is I would look at their caffeine intake. Uh, next slide, please, Leslie. 
Um, <clears throat> as you know, the bladder and the colon sit next to each other. And when the colon gets irritable, uh, so if somebody gets really constipated, uh, it tends to irritate the bladder as well. And especially in women, uh, constipation makes it more likely to actually get bladder infections because the, the bacteria in the colon are the same bacteria that often cause infection. So keeping the colon flowing is probably a good thing too. Adequate fluid that we looked at in the other slide for bladder health is also bowel health. You know, drinking enough fluid helps keep your bowels from backing up. Fiber, you know, our dietitians will and our nurses will help um, both Pablo and Terry look at their diet and how can they add more fiber to their diet. And again, let me just emphasize that fiber by itself doesn't work very well if you don't have enough fluid, right? I mean, you could eat all the popcorn you want. If there's not enough fluid there too, it's, it doesn't have anything to absorb to keep your stools liquid. So uh, more, more fluid uh, as well. Um, okay, next slide. So what, what are we gonna do for poor Pablo and poor Terry? What did I do? Okay, well, let's start with their fluid pills. So Pablo's on a diuretic uh, for his high blood pressure. The dose was higher than necessary. So a lot of the diuretics used for high blood pressure will lower your blood pressure at a low dose. At a higher dose, it may lower it a little bit more, but it causes a lot more bladder irritation. So changing that diuretic or even stopping it and going to a different bladder, a different uh, antihypertensive would make sense. In Terry's case, uh, part of her uh, fluid pill usage was because of her heart failure, and she actually needed some diuretic to maintain a stable um, heart failure regimen. Uh, however, uh, we talked about that, and you know, taking it before you go out in the morning to go for walks is probably not a great idea. So waiting until you come back uh, and taking it. And actually, as long as you're monitoring your weight, that taking it every other day may be fine. And our nurses and our dietitians also work with her about watching her salt intake and other things she can do so that her diuretic dosage can be let lower. And there's other blood, there's other medications for uh, heart failure, which we changed Terry to, which actually improved her heart function. And so she was able to actually get off the diuretics uh, and actually was able to walk more because she felt better. Um, so Pablo's dementia medication, you know, we, we, uh, we talked about that and uh, was, I was very honest that I felt like it probably was not all that helpful and that um, it didn't seem to have changed his function very much. So I felt like we could stop the dementia medicine. So we actually tapered him off the dementia medicine and were able to actually stop his gotta go, gotta go bladder medicine because he... Uh, wasn't on the dementia medicine. We also started him on some medication for his prostate, which helped a lot. So he actually was able to um, uh, have a better uh, control of his bladder because we were, we were looking at that as well. And then for uh, Terry, you know, we work with their diabetes, the dietitian work with their diabetes, the nurses work with their diabetes, the therapist even work with their diabetes as far as exercise. So we were able to get her blood sugar better controlled without so much medication. So her choice of not being on four medicines, we were able to, to meet that. Uh, and our therapist worked with her on, so remember Terry's got that prolapsing bladder. So um, our therapist actually worked with her on uh, pelvic floor, the Kegel exercises. We're able to teach her how to um, build some tone there to have a little better bladder control. They also showed her how to actually use manual uh, pressure over her bladder when she has to urinate to empty her bladder better. So they were able to actually improve her emptying. So with those things, we actually, we actually got uh, Pablo and Terry on less medication. They were able to go back out walking. Sullivan still had to stop off and pee, but, but Pablo and Terry did not have to. So that was a good thing. So how does how do we define success at pace? So <clears throat> you heard all the stuff we did for Pablo and Terry. Let's look at the last slide. So 
success for Pace is look at, look at how those big smiles on their face. They're out walking again, they're living their life. Um, they're feeling like they're in control. And you know, we're gonna, we've given them, I hope, more years of being together with Sullivan to be out there walking. And I believe that is the end. Leslie, I think the last slide is a question. Let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, great. Well, th this is really interesting. Um, if people would like to <laughs> get on camera, <clears throat> and I don't know if Melissa, if you can um, unmute everybody. I don't know if I have that capacity. Um, anyway, I have some able questions. to unmute themselves, and um, you can also um, should be able to add yourselves to the screen. You can also add some questions in the chat. It looks like you guys already have them in the chat too. It does. Okay, we do have a question. It says, do you find alcoholics have a greater issue too? I have a male resident who is also diabetic and obese, who is constantly losing his bladder, even to the extent of wetting the bed at night. He is only in his 60s and no history of dementia. I do see limited mental capacity in his behavior though, perhaps depression. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a complex issue. Uh, you know, obviously people who are alcoholic um, may have significant brain dysfunction. Um, you also wonder about somebody who's obese and drinking about sleep apnea and things like that that may cause nocturnal um, enuresis, may cause people to lose control of their, of their bladder at night. So that would be something that you would look at uh, sort of the broader picture of what's, of what's happening. Uh, alcohol obviously does cause... <laughs> some inhibitions not to work very well uh, and but and physically as well so you know people you know tend to have less control of their bladder when they're consuming alcohol so I hope that address those those things but that would be something that clearly would require would would warrant multiple things and there's also like in the face model for example um, helping people with alcoholism. I mean, working with them, working with medications, working with things, groups that we can set up, getting people to Alcoholics Anonymous if someone wants to do it. Um, so uh, that would be, that, those would be all things that we would do, so. And Leah, who asked the question said, thanks, he does use oxygen, so <clears throat> the issue is likely. Yeah, and that may be somebody that you may want to consider an overnight oximetry just to see if this oxygen level is dropping at night, even with the oxygen. Is there other evidence of sleep apnea? Uh, the other thing is people with sleep apnea tend to have significant peripheral edema. It doesn't go away very easily. So you'll see uh, swollen legs that stay swollen uh, because the hypoxia, the low oxygen at night, causes the the right heart to kind of tighten up. And so the blood coming back can't get back very easily. So they tend to have persistent edema. Whereas most of us old folks, if we raise our legs at night, we actually lose a little bit of edema we have. Oh, he has that too, yeah. she says, in hospital now for a long, like one. Well, there you go. Well, but I, if I think that's a good example, I think of those are things that potentially, I'm not saying that that if he was in pace, we would that wouldn't happen. Obviously, it, it happens to our pace participants. But to think about you know early interventions that may actually lead to improvement, and I and I had many of my nurses and and therapists come and tell me, hey doc, what do you think about this? And oftentimes it's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Great idea. Uh, so I think working as a team with lots of folks, we get you know it's really kind of fun. You know, it's a it's definitely a a team sport. I had a question <clears throat> about folks wearing Depends and as people sit, if they're wheelchair bound and they're wearing diapers, um, what what's the advice about like, how often to change those, you know, so that UTIs don't happen and, you know, I just didn't know. I mean, I think that it's an issue in our society. Yeah, so. no, as, as a great nursing question, Leslie, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, no. Well, I mean, obviously, I I would apply the lot. You know, if my if my underpants get wet because I pee myself, I'd want to change my underpants, right? Yeah. I would not want to wear wet depends. 
most of the technology of those is such that, you know, how, for those of us, uh, you know, I have six kids. <clears throat> the technology of diapers has changed from the beginning of my career with children, which was cloth diapers to, you know, pampers to actually back to cloth diapers because my wife was kind of a socially active person. Uh, but I think that, you know, the advantages of the technology was to wick the fluid away. So clearly, you know, when someone's wet and the diaper's wet enough, it's wet's going against the skin, that, that, that should be, that, that you should try to, mm -hmm. to change that, yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious about that, especially if they have residents that are wheelchair bound and are having yeah. issues. You know. Well, it's it's tough. It's embarrassing for the residents. And, you know, it's difficult when people have difficulty with mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at, I mean, some of these issues, you know, you kind of think, well, somebody's got it depends on, it doesn't really matter if they have urinary frequency. Well, it actually does, right? Because it means how often they have to be changed. What are the risks for skin breakdown? Um, you're absolutely right. If someone's sitting in a wet diaper, and soaking their whole perineum, their in, their their increased risk for bacteria getting there and saying, "Oh, here's a good place to live." Mm -hmm. uh, and then that bacteria from the colon that's not normally sitting in your bladder says, "I'll get in here," and then bingo, we have a bladder infection. Hmm. Thanks. Are there some other questions or comments? No. Well, well, this is probably the middle school group that we're talking to, <laughs> Leslie. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding, guys. I, honestly, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, hopefully this covered the things that you wanted to cover. You know, bladder health is kind of a quote a large topic, and those of us that that care for older adults, as I said before, uh, this is an important uh, issue in in their health for multiple different reasons. So. Yeah, well, thank you for your time and for sharing. I think you gave us some good um, advice about just helping to increase liquids and looking at the medications folks are on and I mean, all just how complex that all is and all the interactions. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so Leah says a major issue out of her property. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. We appreciate all right. your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Evans. You're welcome. Thank you, Liz. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.